Hello, everyone, and welcome to Burning Questions by Arts Equator. I'm Kathy Rowland, the co-founder of Arts Equator. So as our panelists join us, uh, we have our moderator, Nabila Said, already with us. Our panelists will be joining us shortly. I'll go through some of the housekeeping so we can actually um, be ready to start. If you're joining us on Zoom with us today, please request, we request that you keep your video and audio off. This session is being recorded and the video will be made available online at a later date. The session is also being live streamed to the community at howlround.com, which is the theater commons with an international presence. Today, we are joined by audiences watching on HowlRound's web website, as well as its Facebook pages. Arts Equator is a regional and digital platform that is dedicated to covering the arts in Singapore and Southeast Asia. You'll find us at artsequator.com. Burning Questions is a series which attempts to ask some big questions. It offers spaces for regional voices to discuss some of the unasked questions facing the arts community at a time when we are all facing um, a pandemic. Our objective is really less about finding answers, but more to articulate how we are at this moment in the hopes that we may, able to find, we may be able to find some connections with one another during this time. This series is supported by Splice Lights On, with live stream support from HowlRound TV. The, the recordings over the past three panels have been uploaded on our website and we'll share the links in the chat. This evening for our final panel, we have the topic of can critics criticize during a pandemic? This panel is the only Singapore panel out of the series of four that we've held so far. And it's part of the Critics Reading Group program that Arts Equator organized, uh, which ran from October, 2018 to March of 2020 with the support of the National Arts Council. Now, before I hand you over to our moderator, Nabila Said, and the speakers for the session, just a short note about the Q&A. We'll be keeping the Q&A for the last 30 minutes. Uh, and we request that if you do have questions, to please type that into the Zoom chat. Um, for those of you who are watching on live stream, you can also put your questions in the Facebook chat and we'll make sure that those are redirected back to the panelists and to the moderator. Thank you. And with that, I'll leave you with, with Nabila and our four great Singaporean speakers. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Cathy. Um, thanks so much, Cathy, for that introduction. Uh, usually I do the introduction, so it was like quite a weird experience. Um, but today I am moderating this panel with this very spicy question of can critics criticize in a pandemic? Um, and just a bit of introduction, I guess, like with more and more performances going online, the whole idea is uh, how do critics respond? And, and I feel like that is one part of the kind of like layer of the question. The other layer is we are in a pandemic. So what is our role and how does our role uh, change? Um, you know, where do we put criticality during a pandemic? Because I don't think we really put it aside. Like it goes, it goes somewhere, right? And today we'll kind of talk a bit about that. Um, I think when it comes to uh, critiquing how people are responding to a pandemic, there are many ways that we can uh, look at it. For example, you can look at it from the perspective of how a government handles a national crisis. You can look at it as how um, people police uh, people's bodies and movements and even ideas during this time. Uh, but of course, today we are, we are looking at ourselves as art critics, as cultural critics. But even then, I feel like these kinds of like very strict boundaries, um, are, it's very hard to keep to them even like uh, even then and I feel that they too require re-examining um, so when we are looking at a piece of artwork I find that you cannot really divorce yourselves from the fact that we are dealing with this larger thing going on um, and and some of some of the ideas and words that um, I've said I've just said um, have, an, have a violent edge to them. So as critics, do we blunt the violence of, of the times that we're living now or do we expose the violence for what it is almost? So um, this is a, a little provocation for my, my speakers before we go into um, the rest of it. Um, but I, and I don't want to get ahead of myself. So uh, firstly, um, thank you so much, uh, Jermaine, Jocelyn, Zahan and Selting for joining me. Uh, if you haven't already, you can switch on your um, audio so we can uh, start getting into the discussion proper. Uh, so my first question, I'm going, I'm going straight into it. Uh, so warning. Um, 
and also to help to introduce yourselves to the audience who may not be familiar with your work um, at the moment. Can you tell us, um, describe the kind of critic that you are and how does the practice of criticism actually fit within your artistic practice? Who wants to start first? Polite smiles. <laughs> Sahan, you broke the silence, so. Uh, <laughs> okay, I'll do the difficult task of starting first. Uh, hi, my name is Sahan. I'm pursuing my PhD in performance studies. And I consider myself more of a performance practitioner, especially within the Singaporean context. But over the years, I've written a couple of short pieces of uh, criticisms for Art, Arts Equator. Uh, and these are mainly in the realm of experimental performance and social practice. Uh, my personal area of research is mainly focused on performance history in Singapore, particularly around the restriction of licensing and funding of performance art from 1994 to 2003 in Singapore. Yeah. And so the practice of criticism extends beyond my own work and also the work of others to like what you mentioned earlier, like a criticism of the state's regulatory gestures of arts and culture in Singapore. Yeah. Thank you, Sahan. Uh, I'm going by the order of my Zoom. So uh, Jocelyn. Hey, hi, I'm Jocelyn. Uh, and I'm a practitioner, writer and educator uh, uh, in, in both dance and theater. Um, as a, as a writer, as someone who writes reviews, I uh, come very much from a phenomenological perspective. So I believe that one's experience of uh, watching a performance is precisely that. It's precisely a full body experience. And that cannot be separated from your past memories and, and knowledge. And, you know, we are, whatever you're feeling right now, you're too hot, too cold, eat too much for dinner. All of those things are valid. And I uh, believe that those experiences uh, it should not be different re whether you are a regular audience member or whether you're there on assignment to write about it. So I believe that one's writing um, about the experience will always be subjective, um, which I, I guess maybe is different from how some other uh, writers may approach it. Um, but also I'd like to note that su being subjective or uh, acknowledging the subjective is not the same as um, writing things that are unsubstantiated. Yeah, so as for how um, writing or, or reviewing sits within my wider practice, um, well, I mean, because I also create work myself, I produce, uh, I teach, um, and I see my writing as part of this wider practice, uh, part of the wider art ecosystem that we are in, yeah, that we need more conversation in general about work and about how, uh, how, how people are doing things, how, you know, kind of what's out there, and that really helps and it informs my own work, it informs my teaching, and yeah, really it's just so interconnected. Thanks, Joss. Uh, Xiao Ting, let's hear from you. Hi, I'm Xiao Ting. Thanks for being here with us today. So I write. I think that's the thing that I primarily do. And I've been writing criticism. But I think when I say criticism, I don't mean like criticism, but like an expensive more criticism, which is really just listening very deeply and also just being present and like channeling all of that, how I feel, what I think of during the cause of the performance and then to like translate that into like something else and that something else need not always be words it can be like private emails voice messages like all these small things like as long as it's a communication and then something that I do privately that not a lot of people know is that I just blow bubbles and I think that blow bubbles to make bubble drawings like to make it clear and I think that also ties in how criticism lies in my wider artistic practice in a sense that because when you blow bubbles you just observe and like bubbles are very sensitive things like just like how performances like what Jocelyn was saying like it can be affected by like 10,000 things like the temperature and all of those things yeah so criticism really is just about listening and how to utilize that listening and what you have absorbed and like you know to like pass out it's like a vessel in a sense yeah thank you Jamie and how about you Hi, I'm Jermaine. I, so just actually going on from what Xiao Ting said, I think I see my criticism as a kind of transmission. Um, and the image that comes to mind is like, a, is like the 
coiled telephone cord. So it's not something that's like clean or that's linear, but it, it, it can bend, it can twist, and it has tension. Um, and, and I'm primarily a dance artist, but I started um, getting into criticism because I just wanted to be able to see more, um, to be exposed to more performances. Um, and I think now with my interest and my baby steps into um, dramaturgy, I think um, that there are a lot of overlaps in terms of the criticality, um, but also the care that informs like both these facets of my practice. Thank you so much for that. I think um, I was just thinking while preparing for this panel about how like, I think historically the role of the critic has, has evolved so much. Um, I think he, uh, primarily like in the early days, it was definitely like more of like the mainstream media who was uh, pre like uh, printing a lot of these reviews or maybe the main mode of reviewing was in the mainstream media and definitely like the Straits Times. Um, and to get a review was like, you know, it's almost like very, it was very dif difficult to do. And a review could, could, I mean, not in the same way that they do in like, let's say London or New York, but a review can affect your career in, in a negative way, you know? So um, I felt, I feel like historically the relationship between the artist and the reviewer has been a lot more fraught. Um, and and there, there was one person that will be the reviewer, you know, with a capital R almost. Uh, and and I think with the five of us, even as a kind of like a microcosm, we are seeing how we are not just reviewers, right? We are also artists, we are also poets, we are bubble blowers, we are dancers and movers. Um, so it becomes like, uh, it, it becomes a kind of like a layered kind of, uh, I don't know, I feel like criticism becomes embedded within a larger thing, whatever that thing is. And with each five of us, the thing, that thing is different, you know? Uh, which is kind of cool. But maybe leading on to my next question, because I've not really talked about, we've not talked about the pandemic at all with, with this, the fact that first question, but how have you as a critic responded to COVID-19? Like what kind of questions or thoughts have uh, run through your mind as you think about um, your role as a critic? Um, maybe I'll start since I'm, uh, I'm also part of the reading group and you know try to be fair a bit. Um, Definitely, as the editor of Arts Equator, there was a time where I felt like I, I, uh, I needed, we needed, we needed, we needed almost like a moratorium on reviews, you know, for a while. Just especially that first part of the circuit breaker when it was really like people were saying like it felt like a grieving kind of period, you know. There were people who were who were on their sofas, not knowing what to do because they couldn't make art because the theaters were closed. Um, and for our Arts Equator website, it really felt like it wasn't the right time to be publishing reviews. I mean, of course, there wasn't a lot of art to that was happening anyway. But if there was, the, the you know there were some like smaller kind of shows that people were doing, or even putting old works online. It definitely didn't feel like it was the right time for us to publish any reviews, la, basically. Uh, so that was like, from my perspective, I, I definitely felt like as a reviewer, I almost felt like I didn't have, um, yeah, I just like physically couldn't, like physically could not, you know. So um, yeah, how, how did you guys um, react to the pandemic? Maybe I'll just start because uh, it's sort of leading off from the earlier point that you make about the, uh, the monopoly that the, critic, the critic used to have uh, via mainstream media to like pronounce or have a verdict on the performance and how that has shifted. And particularly, I think uh, the pandemic and COVID has already, you know, it's like people are talking about it as the great leveler of sorts. You know, it's a more distributed kind of sense of power and access. Uh, and because of the pandemic, we are realizing that certain inequalities are bubbling to the surface. Uh, so if we consider that and extend it to the role of the cultural critic, I think that's also happening in a way. So unlike the past when the critic used to have the final say and articulates the authoritative version of the pr production that eventually makes it to the archive that people will reference in the future, with COVID and digitalization of performances, access is not necessarily restricted to the live event. Uh, and of course that changes and transforms the very notion of performance, but at the same time, it expands a certain potential. Uh, and in the beginning of uh, the pandemic, there's this 
uh, interesting phenomena of various theater companies rushing both in Singapore and internationally to release archival videos. Uh, and, and that moment was interesting for me because some of these productions I missed when I was like a theater goer or uh, maybe I was out of the country and because they are live, you know, you would not have access to them otherwise. And some of them are like international productions that we would never be able to watch because we never had the opportunity to travel. Uh, so you could actually watch the production, the archival document and do like a critical review of the critics and their version of how they read it in the past and also collate various response and then verify or you know there's a there's a verification process where you check whether it tallies with your understanding and experience of the piece itself so that was an interesting phenomenon that happened in the beginning uh, i'll pause there and let the rest answer before i go on <laughs> yeah the pandemic actually brought like me to ask more micro questions I think I made it very clear that there is a difference between drawing, a, like watching something and forming an impression of critic and drawing the thread together and delivering the critic. I think those two are very different things. And the pandemic somehow, like something I realized is that it's become more intimate, like rather than publishing something like a one-to-many kind of way, it became more like one-to-one -one, or even like one-to-two. And I think like it kind of brought back the the mode of critic as a conversation as opposed to like, you know, like what Zuhan said, like a final thing. Yeah. Mm. To like carry on the conversation. So you actually yeah. do something. Hmm? Do you yeah. actually do that? Like write to the artist or something? Yeah, I did actually. Like, and it's very informal. Like it's like human to human. It's not like critic to artist. Because I don't resonate with the whole like critic being the sole holder of power. I think that's ridiculous to me. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thanks for that. Joss or Jermaine? Yeah, I think like what you said, Nabila, I, I was also very much struck by that initial period where, you know, everyone's just frozen and yeah, there's this grief and yeah, in fact, I, I actually maybe a, I had a period of about two to three weeks where I just refused to watch anything. Uh, yeah, it was just too much. right? And when I, I eventually picked myself up and started to like, okay, I, I also felt slightly guilty because I was like, okay, um, as, as a, you know, as someone in the field and, and yeah, I need to practice and I need to like keep on top of everything. So that, that was the anxiety coming in as well. So I started to watch, but I think resonating with quite, with what uh, the rest of have said also, it's more of, um, I think what happened, uh, what, I mean, what tended to happen was because we were also um, having a lot of watch parties, having, uh, you know, friends in small groups watching together. So the so-called critique or analysis also happens on that level. Uh, it was more of having discussions with friends after, after watching the, the performance. I, mean, I felt hesitant for a long time to actually put anything that's like written and that's out there. But it's more, yeah, it, it became a very much more close-knit kind of thing. Jermaine, feel free to jump in, but I just quickly, um, quickly say that like, um, so me and Cory Tan, who, uh, who, Cory, who actually moderated the last panel last week on intimacy, we actually, uh, because we didn't know how to review, we decided to co-write a, a, a P, an article that was about not knowing how to review. So we wrote like a 5,000 word um, <laughs> essay about not knowing what to write, which is ironic, but um not not an unexpected from from us, I suppose. Um, yeah, Jermaine, what about you? What 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 were your kind of responses to what's happening? Mm, I think I've been really quite quiet throughout this whole period, just because uh, I don't know whether it's something that didn't exist before, but I think it's heightened now that I feel like I don't want to put anything out lightly or without sufficient like thought or like just for the sake of like publishing something or putting out a video. Um, and, and I feel like, um, yeah, just having that huge rush of uh, uh, things online popping up made me realize that um, I really needed to have a reason to, to put something up. Yeah, rather than just um, kind of like throwing out a response very quickly. Yeah. For sure. Um, Thanks for that, Jermaine. Uh, so we actually have a poll for the audience. I don't think we've done it yet. So we have a very 
cheeky question for the audience. You should be seeing it now. Um, yeah, with the question, criticism is an essential act during the pandemic. Yes or no? Uh, as it goes with this poll, it's always yes or no. There's no gray area. Very terrible. But um, yeah, I'm looking at the results. It's quite interesting. I don't know whether panelists, can you see? No, right? Okay. Uh, we'll give a few more seconds for people. Hello. Yeah, thank you. Forgot to. <laughs> it's okay. It happens. This uh, yeah. life events. Uh, yeah. So I think everyone, more or less, everyone has voted. So it is 82% of people say that criticism is an essential act during the pandemic. Yes. <laughs> yeah. um, and 18% say no, which is quite interesting. Of course, when I was doing this poll, I, was, I purposely used the word essential, which if you're a Singaporean, you would know um, why. Just because this idea of whether arts is essential or non-essential became a kind of a, a point of contention in Singapore. Um, but I put criticism there because, you know, we, we are really the center of attention critics. So it's a rare time for us to be um, part of a, a poll like this. But, but it's quite interesting to see, and it's, I think it's quite heartening to see this response that 82% say that it's essential. Um, yeah, I don't know whether anyone wants to respond to that. This is not planned, but <laughs> are we essential, guys? I think criticality is always essential, regardless of whatever you put out. Because I think like I resonate with what Jermaine was talking about, you know, like there's like 10,000 things out there. But criticality doesn't mean you have to shout out your criticality. I think the way you interface with the world, like interpersonally in the small circles are also, I don't know, like when I read that question, the poll, I was thinking of criticality instead of criticism. So I edited your question in my head. <laughs> That's fine. That's fine. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a bit of a cheeky thing. I mean, there's a reason why this whole uh, burning questions is also called, I also uh, named, um, titled the question as like, can critics criticize in a pandemic? It's not really about, it. It's, the critic can be anyone. It's not like just the five of us in this, in this panel, you know. Um, but have, has anyone tried writing and have you felt that you needed to like recalibrate or, of, or maybe even like soften your eye as a critic? I think echoing what, what Xiao Ting said first, firstly, <laughs> the first part of my response is that, um, yeah, I think criticism is a very dirty word <laughs> in the Singapore context, unfortunately. But, you know, I mean, as a, even like when studying lit everything, you, you uh, lit students would know that criticism is a neutral word. It's not supposed to be a like, oh, bad, you know. So it's, that's the way I approach it. Um, all, all the time in any context and I think yeah, pandemic or not right uh, but so having said that within this uh, I mean in this uh, period I, I did recently have to write a review or I was asked to write a review <laughs> by articulator um, on, on PhD's uh, recent uh, performance uh, pure and it was uh, it was quite a challenging thing to do I mean you know having said that yeah I was actually very resistant to, to it um, to putting anything out there and for, for reasons that we've all mentioned. Um, but I, I believe that um, uh, in general, a, a review always uh, should have I mean, a balance or should have, uh, should, should have both um, contextualization as well as, you know, kind of your other traditional uh, critique, right, uh, in terms of the staging elements and whatnot. So the, you know, kind of in this uh, situation, what I felt was appropriate to do was to dial up that the volume on the contextualization, you know, rather than focus and, and harp on the, the other other aspects aspects of the work in particular. And I and, and the context that we are in right now is that there are a lot of productions being put online or being created for, for an online platform. And uh, no but what um you know what what I was reflecting on was that we are as artists actually very ill-equipped to 
I mean, most of us, lah, I would say, would be not not that not that well equipped to create work for online mediums. I mean, we're so used, we've had decades of experience in the theatre doing live things, doing perform performances um, in a physical uh, space, right? So it's it's not anybody's fault. And it's, uh, of course, we are grappling with this, this uh, entirely new thing. And, you know, actually the artists who are doing those, the, who are doing the work now are the ones putting themselves at the forefront and, and trying to uh, experiment and maybe fail, maybe succeed, but you know, it's all an experiment. So, so they, I mean, <laughs> kudos to them, right? Yeah, so that was kind of the, what I was, what I, I um, focused on in the review was more about the, the art form and what we uh, kind of, you know, we, we really lack the language to, to deal with that. How can we, uh, or, or rather it remains to be seen what the, uh, what artists in Singapore will, will kind of move towards. Yeah. Yeah. It's almost like like there's this moving thing and like we're trying to pin it, but it's still moving, you know. So like you're only move pinning it at a kind of temporary spot. So so that that act of pinning is also yeah, is what I guess we I'm grappling with. Um I shared the link to uh Joss's um review in the chat for anyone who wants to read it. Um yeah. Jermaine or uh, yeah, Jermaine, do you want to respond to that? Uh, I haven't written anything per se. Um, I've had conversations um, with artists um, who have put up performances. Uh, and I think it's, I guess it's quite nice to reciprocate the amount of intimacy that they're trying to put up in their performances um, with my own intimacy of providing a response as opposed to just kind of throwing 400 words up um, somewhere. Um, and, and so I saw something um, in June um, by an artist called Merlin Chow. So she's um, primarily a dance artist, but she's actually moving into physical theater. Um, and she put up a show called Intimacy Currency. And when we had a conversation about it, maybe about a week after, um, I think I, I, I started the conversation by saying that, uh, let's discuss this as friends. Um, so I think I was very clear about the stance that I wanted to take. Uh, that I, yeah, I could provide a certain like, critical point of view, but I was also going to, um, yeah, make sure that I spoke uh, with care, with a certain amount of caution, um, because obviously, like, maybe there, I mean, there are elements of the performance that required a certain level of vulnerability, um, and I, I couldn't go into it, um, like completely like, oh, I'm just an audience member that logged in to watch you on Zoom. Um, and she actually shared that um, some of the things that she decided to put up in the performance, um, she might not have chosen to do if she had staged it live. So I think that's also a testament to the amount of, um, yeah, the level of vulnerability that she decided to put out, yeah, in the performance. Mm. I, I was thinking about how, I think one of the earliest uh, sh online shows in Singapore was the Corona Logs by Singapore Repertory Theatre. Uh, and I think there was a lot of excitement about uh, when the show was, you know, about to like, like be live on Facebook. And then after that, there was a review on the Straits Times, which, which I think it was a review on, from the Straits Times that was very much like a review from the Straits Times, you know. Um, but I think I feel like there were some uh, of the people involved who were not so happy with some of the maybe less positive uh, ways that it, uh, the show was being talked about. Um, and and I, I thought that was like quite an interesting thing to kind of witness. Um, and, and for me, of course, I was just glad that I wasn't in that position, of course, as a reviewer, but then also seeing like you almost follow the lead. Like the question for me as a reviewer is, do I follow the lead of the artist? Like, do I only wait for the artist to, to invite criticism, then I give criticism? Because that feels like, a bit strange as well like um because we don't always get the invitation you know and and if we wait for an invitation what if we regress back to how it was in in like back then in singapore when when artists were a bit more in opposition to reviewers because then i think that's a bit dangerous as well so um yeah i thought that was uh quite interesting um there's a question oh let's see 
Oh, let's take this question to make it interesting. Um, how do we draw the boundaries between talking about works by your with your friends versus how you talk about it in a formal context? I think Xiao Ting spoke a little bit about this, like a review that's like this big review versus just you know talking about it with your friends. Just, uh, do you wanna do you wanna respond to that, Xiao Ting? Yeah, I think the difference is that when you're talking to your friends, they already know where you're coming from. Like I think there is already a shared context and understanding, and most probably you watch the same thing. But when your when the audience is a lot larger, like there are not people that you know that right, I think there needs to be a lot more care and tact, I think. Because with friends, you can just say things as it is, and if they don't understand or they take offense, they can ask you immediately in a conversation. But when it's a review, like you have no idea what kind of like what, what kind of frame of mind do approach the re like the review like there is always this gap in between the river and the re the reviewer and the recipient so i think like just now jamil was talking about care and i think like that's something that i've been thinking a lot about because i think when it comes to criticism that i don't think like you should just avoid that criticism like if if you really don't didn't enjoy it like it's not to like just avoid it altogether but more like how do you frame it in such a way that speaks care Caringly? Is caring? Caring. Yeah, caringly. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Just to just to add on to that, I think there's this interesting because the, the question basically was asking about boundaries, right? And how do you draw boundaries? And what we have witnessed with everything that's going on is a breakdown of the boundaries of what what is considered like work and home and public and private. So with that. As a, as a fall out of that, as uh, you know, the, the role of the critic also has to be interrogated in a way where it's no longer like the artist and the critic, where that boundary is also like work, home, public, private, also blurred. And just to add on to what everybody has already been saying, you know, is the act of criticism as an intimate act, you know, as something that is uh, caring and sort of cur curating, which the root of the word is basically caring for or like the conservator, the preservation or maintenance of a certain kind of work, you know, that, that kind of reproduction of the work itself uh, in, a, in multiple forms. You know, a, I, I see this time as not a time to blunt critical faculties, but to recalibrate it in a way that, you know, writes a different script than what is possible for the work itself, but also the artist, and start a conversation on how the the work itself can be documented multiple ways and multiple perspectives. Yeah. So expanding instead of like narrowing and 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 foreclosing possibilities. Yeah. Mm. Um. I my next question is kind of like forcing you all to to take a stand a bit. So the question is negative reviews during a pandemic, yay or nay, and why? Jocelyn, what do you think? Mm. Yeah, uh, well, I don't, uh, again, uh, reiterating what, what Zahan said, I, I don't see the pandemic as a reason to, to uh, you know, relax our 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 critique or relax um the criteria by which we we watch things and we um, understand things, um you know I, I to give to give a personal analogy right I mean because I teach as well I teach dance I used to dance uh you know in and, and take exams and performances all that and if you are injured before a a major performance or exam you just go and do it, right? I mean, you can, you, let's say you sprain your knee or ankle, you can wear a knee or ankle guard, but the presence of that guard is not going to make the examiner relax its, uh, their criteria when they, when they um, allocate their, 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 um, you know, their grades. So, you know, and it's the same for any like sports, you know, sports people uh, for competitive context, pretty much similar, right? That you, you just, if you're sick, you just suck it up and do it and you may get an outcome that is, not as great as you would if you were not sick, but unfortunately, you that's you, you, you do it with that awareness. So I think it's uh, you know the in to draw that parallel, the, the pandemic is not a reason or an excuse 
to relax the criteria, I feel. Um, but that said, right, it's the same thing that I've been saying about context and, you know, as a, when I critique something that I want to always bring into the, the I mean, bring, bring to the forefront the, the context uh, you know, and uh, also obviously justify things that you're saying. Lah. So it's not that no uh, negative comments can be allowed at all because I think that is not helpful to, to us, to artists, to the scene. Yeah, I think following with the metaphor that you use, I think it's the fact that we are all wearing the ankle guard. It's not just the artists or the data practitioners. And and like the provocation that you drew, like Nabila, I think if if it's honest, negativity is not to be like shied away from. Yeah, and also like, let's say like, okay, like we are all wearing anchor guards and then like, let's say you go and watch something and you really, really didn't enjoy it. And then I think the re my response will be to delve deeper into like, why do I not enjoy it? Is it because I had a certain expectations of performances that the online format just didn't meet? Or is it because like it spoke to something that I just disagreed with like fundamentally? Like I think there are so many reasons as to why we like or dislike things and as critics, it's almost a responsibility. It is a responsibility to interrogate your own responses, because I think we feel strongly because there is a certain push and pull, and like as critics, you identify the push and pull and like kind of like contextualize it as what Justin was saying, and also like expanding it to the different associations to speak to the time that we live in. Mm. Um, Jermaine, maybe you can, if you don't mind, I jump in. If you want, you can respond. But I was also thinking about how, like, right now, artists in Singapore, at least, are uh, a lot of them are creating work in response, especially to a grant that is being offered, right? Like, you can't really get um, like monetary help from, from the government as an artist except to create work. And, and I feel like if the equation of the critic is removed from it, right, I feel that it becomes like a dystopic thing that is being done where work is being done, but no feedback is being given then it seems like people are just creating to, to, to get the grant, which is so, which to me does not make sense. Um, so I almost feel like as a critic, I can help to normalize the equation a bit by, by, by making that, yeah, making kind of like the ecosystem a bit more um, like normal. I don't know whether the word is normal because the word normal now is weird, but it makes it less of a weird thing and it makes it more, I almost, I'm trying to to regain what we are what we've lost with with how the arts the art ecosystem used to run back then where it was like okay a work and then a critique and then maybe conversations can ripple out from there but if we cut out the reviewing part then those thing other parts get cut off also um so I so it's kind of like a slightly different from what you are saying but um I want to try to to restore normalcy by having the voice of the critic, which means that a negative re review would still have a, f a place during this time, I suppose. Mm, and I think, I mean, I, I guess while it's true that people might be making work in response to like the grants that are available, but I also like to think that people are not just making work like only for that purpose. And I think the amount, I mean, the, the, the process that artists go through, um, I would think as a critic, I would still want to do justice to, to that, to the amount of thought and, and perhaps even more thought now that everything is on this new format. Um, and, and I wonder about this idea of like intertwining justice with mercy. Um, it's like, it's like, okay, I can, I can still be just and I, and I can still pronounce somebody guilty, but I might be merciful and not give you like so many years in prison. <laughs> so I guess they can coexist. Um, and it's about the way that the criticism is delivered. Mm. Mm. I guess mercy sounds quite scary <laughs> as something that we can wield, but um, what you're saying, I feel like chimes, like with the whole idea of critique as care, um, for me, it kind of gels to that. Yeah. Yeah. Has everyone answered, by the way? Please feel free to answer again or change your answer. It's totally fine. Um, but what, what really is the role of the critic during the crisis? Um, if, if, if anyone hasn't, hasn't kind of responded to this, if anyone wants to 
share share your thoughts about that. There's one more note I have, and sorry for taking up so much space. Uh, yeah, the, it's like with all the international offerings that are being made possible, I see the role of the critic as really the mediator and the translator, um, especially in this time where, you know, basically you could be watching a show that that teleports you from New York to Miami to some other city. And it's really the role of the localized critic to weave it together uh, and, to, and to mix make sense of it or translate it or, or record it or archive it for a certain constituency. And this can be geopolitical constituency. It also can be like a cause or something that you believe in. Uh, so it's, it's important to have this person as facilitator or interlocutor. So especially at this point in time where access has been reconfigured in such a radical way. Yeah. Hmm. Anyone else want to respond to that? Oh, oh, we have a question. But maybe before that, um, I yeah, maybe before the question by Katrina, which seems quite long and uh, might need to wrestle with it a bit more. Um, can I check? Because I think uh, Xiao Ting was, it, was talking about subjectivity. No, someone was saying about subjectivity, Jocelyn. Mm -hmm. um, I, I am also from that kind of school of reviewing where like I'm very subjective. I just cannot. Um, w because I started in the Straits Times, I was a review in the Straits Times. And I remember how uh, like we were supposed to be quite objective. We were supposed to be very objective. Sometimes I couldn't even use the word I. I, I was saying like, oh, this reviewer thinks, you know, as if as if I'm not a self, you know, um, with, with my own kind of biases, which, which I am. But do you feel like there's a, a, a even more blurring of the boundaries between yourself as yourself and yourself as a critic um, when it comes to writing, let's say, a piece of criticism? Yeah, I, I think um, maybe not so... Yeah, blurring of boundaries, yes, in the sense that it's not just for me as a... Uh, critic or reviewer, but me as an uh, everybody as, as an audience now is very the, like the boundaries are so blurred, right? Because you're at home, you can be in your pajamas, you could have, have be eating or whatever, and that that is uh, th that's what we, everyone is dealing with. So I think already we have that boundary that is broken or that's blurred. And uh, but I for me the subjectivity actually comes in maybe even more strongly now, or or um you know it's as a way of of me. Uh, or, or it's how I interpret or how I, I, I um, kind of frame the, the care that I think Xiao Ting and Jermaine are talking about that you know it's more like okay so we're all in this situation and everyone is doing uh, trying to put work online um, but what can you know but okay and maybe I didn't like this or you know or I thought this didn't work then but then the subjectivity comes in because I, I'll be like okay why did I not like this uh, why you know why did I think it did it, it didn't work you know maybe maybe they actually did whatever they could already but it's just that I'm at home and I'm eating and I, you know I'm just not paying attention so it's my own problem right so I think all these things we need to to be aware of when we are thinking about about all the work that's going on right now yeah yeah I think rather than like a boundary between like let's say selling the human and selling the critic right. Like the way I see it is that selling the critic is just extra selling, in a sense that <laughs> like it's a it's a version of myself that is a lot more reflexive, that is a lot more attuned to what I'm feeling, not just in terms of what I hear and what I see, but also the emotional responses or like the thoughts that pop into my mind as I watch something. So I think just different layers of the self. Yeah. Mm. I mean, I, I, I definitely echo that as well, Xiao Ting. Um, I, I feel like I need, to, I, I even double down on the Nabila as a human when I'm writing criticism now. Like, so maybe before that I can be like, oh, I'm, I'm the reviewer, but I'm also me. But now, now I feel like I need to expose myself like even more as myself, which is quite weird. So even that so-called 5,000 word um, essay, which um, I think we will pop the link uh, in the chat. Um, we were, me and Corey were both kind of like exposing parts of ourselves that we don't usually expose, even for critics who are usually quite personal. 
Um, so it's it was oh thank you Zahan. So it's almost like doubling down on on the subjectivity, you know, like what uh, Joss is also saying lah. Yeah. Yeah, Jermaine, what do you think? I think because you feel the subjectivity more keenly, um, and I think this is something that I realized just because you you like even in a live performance you share the same time but you don't share the same space so like all the more I feel like I can't situate myself like I don't know uh, where I am um, in relation to the performance so well I mean as opposed to if I was sitting in the audience um, and I think that then causes me to uh, be more subjective or to highlight whatever else that I'm sensing in my space as part of the experience of the performance. Mm. Yeah. That makes- like, Nab- Nabila, you mentioned it in your review. Uh, also, like this lack of a uh, like, sort of like, you know, when you go to the theater space, then you the lights dim and you're prepared emotionally to encounter work. Whereas now, like immediately after this panel, we leave the meeting room and I have to go back into my daily life. So it's a little bit like what Jermaine has already mentioned, where this, you know, like people are messaging me in the middle of this panel or so, and you can't like silence it, or there isn't this like private protected space of the theatre, which now we have realised is something that was in a way a privilege or a, a, a fiction actually. Uh, and, and, and so this sense of like restoring to normalcy is something that I'm not sure if it's possible the restoration to normalcy. There's a deep desire to revert, but uh, you know, how oh, can yeah. we ever go back? And what no form? <laughs> yeah, like can we ever go back to a theater and feel the same way that we used to feel uh, with everything that we have encountered since? Yeah. Yeah, that would be interesting. I, I was kind of thinking about how um, I was reading about new media dramaturgies because I feel like increasingly as a critic, at least I am lacking, like what Joss was saying earlier, I'm lacking some of the vocabulary or, or knowledge about dealing with work online because because I feel like even though it's new for us, like new media as, as a form has been there you know, for a while. And it's just that for me personally, I wasn't very um, like fluent in it or I didn't know how to critique it. So... Um, I was trying to read up to kind of level up, you know, as a, as a critic almost, but it's hard lah, because ideas of like intimacy, of like embeddedness, of like what is life and what is not life, um, I don't know enough, which is also partially why I feel a bit of this kind of, I don't know enough to critique, so how, but of course I just try anyway lah, <laughs> with, with some of my reviews. Um, but in terms of like new kind of languages or terms, have any of you, do you have any experience about learning a new like term, like not, not terminologies, but really learning about new maybe performance qualities that you are um, observing from work online? Rahan. I mean, the infrastructure of Zoom and you know, I'm, I'm the last person to be like adverse to adopting technology, but with the pandemic, it just felt like I'm held ransom by this infrastructure. And that's the thing that I cannot reconcile. You know, it's like you have to use this or else, you know, and I would have loved to have the time and space to explore it on more equitable, whatever that means, terms. But now it's like, you know, I have to learn how to hide all non-participants. I have to learn how to frame my Zoom camera in a certain way in order to participate in a performance. And that for me felt like I was, like I didn't have a choice. And that was the most difficult thing to grapple with, this lack of uh, time to adjust to this uh, infrastructure. (laughs) Do you mean? as an artist as well like both ways yeah so the interesting thing that I mentioned you know in in our pre-conversation was that I wrote a piece of criticism for this dance performance called G uh, and now it received one of those grants to be translated into like online uh, production and we are using the zoom infrastructure yeah so that's a literal example of how as a critic, uh, uh, you know, you're sitting with the work and maintaining the work in a certain way and growing with the work 
and now I'm like a dramaturg for the media infrastructure. Uh, yeah, so that's how the roles have shifted and evolved. And I'm still not sure if it will work, you know, and that's the exciting thing, but also the worrisome thing, yeah. Hmm. Anyone want to respond to what Sahan said or about what I said earlier? I think with now I'm thinking about distance and power dynamic even more keenly. And especially, you know, like in a Zoom format, let's say, you know, like there are like 36 non-video participants and I have no idea what kind of facial expressions they have. I have no idea whether they're just like sleeping or angry or like smiling or laughing. And I think, and this, and I, when I was one of the non-video participants, then I become a lot more aware of whether like I'm being part of the consideration of the practitioner whether they have thought about that or like, is this like lack of presence or absence, whatever you want to call it, is something that's intended or it's just, you know, like because of circumstance. Yeah, and also distance, you know, like this whole, like I can't touch anyone and then like touch being such a central, I mean, there's been a lot of things trying to break it. And I think like, I think when we're like thinking about, I'm thinking about what Zahan said about the failure of it, like the impossibility of touch in an online thing. Like it just, you just can't. Yeah. And like those things pop up constantly in all the online performance that I've watched. Even if it's like not overtly, like it's on my mind. Mm. Yeah. Actually, actually, ironically, whenever there's like a technological breakdown or like transmission break, right? I feel very energized. Yeah, I have fear. <laughs> I feel like, wow, we are all feeling it at the same time like you know so rare um yeah jocelyn yeah it's one of those these, these breakdowns right it's one of those few things that remind you that you are oh yeah like this we're in this together and you know because otherwise you can get really distant you know, when you're just behind the screen yeah i i think one i, I don't have the language for it again it's this whole thing about the new you know whatever form and we don't have the language but what i'm noticing is that okay, this is this may be a personal preference thing but um yeah, I, I, what I'm noticing is that the, this consideration for, for the audience, for what the audience is um, not just seeing but experiencing, I think that is a very big factor now in, you know, in, in uh, whether the work is compelling or not. Um, yeah, I think one, one thing that, uh, one, one work that I, I can mention is um, a surveillance by Sigma, uh, a dance company. I think this was done late May or something. Um, and it was, uh, I, I, I was actually very engaged with that because, um, you know, rather than uh, just have a camera there with a static angle and recording whatever's going on in the room, which, which I think is pretty common, um, this, they, in the choreography of the, of the work, they not, just, they not only talk about choreography of the bodies, but choreography of the screens and the, the camera angles and everything. So in a way, it's like film, like dance film, um, where they made a lot of, of uh, very obvious choices uh, to use the camera angles to create more interest. Um, and, and then we talk about this, this idea of tactility and all that also that is missing. And I think with that, you know, that the camera angles really helped. Um, there, was, there was one instance where um, it was, where the camera was, was like facing a mirror. So you get this like, yeah, endless, you know, uh, yeah, I don't know what the, the, uh, mm -hmm term is but yeah that, that was really very fascinating to watch actually that sequence yeah Jamin you want to mm, yeah I think yeah I agree that like I think the way that they set it up um, even though it, it wasn't they didn't do it live they did they recorded it in one take and they put it up um, even though it wasn't live uh and there were there, there weren't any moments that directly addressed the audience or like try to reach out through the screen kind of thing. Um, but there were very surprisingly tender moments, like one performer like putting her hand out and then like a hand would actually appear in the other performer's screen, like things like that, that you could associate um, with the experience of, um, as opposed to it being, I guess, done more literally. Um, but I think one thing I noticed um, also was that while we were watching um, that, that video that Sigma put up, um, there was like a lot of buzz on the like live Facebook live stream 
and and people I don't know I guess because like the the, the etiquette of the theater is gone right like you're not just sitting there in the dark in your own seat like people are like putting emojis and like commenting like oh that was so cool and all that and 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 yeah I guess people feel like they can do that and um to extend that to Zoom, I think there is a greater expectation of being involved as an audience as opposed to previously, just because the, the, the kind of etiquette or the social contract, I guess, of the theater is, is no longer there. Mm. That's quite interesting, because like, I mean, I didn't watch surveillance, but the idea of the hand thing, right? It's almost like, okay, for me, so based on what you, you all like described, for me, it's like it depends on my mood for the day, whether or not I, I will be willing to suspend my my you know my belief a, a little bit to be like wow kind of magic or be like ugh like like you know it reminds me of how impossible this whole thing is you know it it almost depends on how you feel that day but okay I didn't watch it so maybe I shouldn't say so much um so we 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 are actually uh now into our like Q and A section of of this panel so I I will address Katrina's uh question. So uh, just to maybe contextualize, Katrina Santiago, she was one of our panelists for last week's panel on intimacy uh, online. So her question is, um, how do we navigate uh, the whole tendency where people who mount online productions feel like there's enough reason to celebrate their work? Um, and and, and uh, she has a specific example where the Virgin Lab Fest in Manila, I feel like um, there are some like critical responses of uh, I suppose like negative <clears throat> uh, responses to it and the artists were not forthcoming about this like negative kind of criticisms. Um, so she says, how do we deal with this kind of push and pull between hooray, you did a work given these terrible times and okay, wait, was that even a good work at all? Um, yeah. What do we think, panelists? It's difficult to comment because it's such a specific context, but that question really made me think like even before the pandemic happened, there were such conversations ongoing about the right of a criti critic to point out certain flaws within a worthy experiment, you know, and we, we have that re incantation of like Kuo Pao Kun's, you know, it's like worthy success or worthy failure. I can't remember the exact wording, but basically, you know, it's like, do you experiment to fail or do you experiment to succeed? Uh, and what do you do with experiments that fail? Um, so yeah, it's, it, it's basically sustaining that conversation into and, and elevating the stakes of it within this crisis. Uh, but that conversation has already been ongoing. And I think it also exposes a certain kind of distrust between the community and the critic uh, if that phenomenon does happen. So it, it actually reveals that the infrastructure of the arts ecology perhaps uh, requires certain reconfiguration and balance of power in a way uh, if, if that conversation is surfacing. And I'm just transposing it to a Singaporean context also. Uh, so I might be doing the question uh, sort of injustice by transposing. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's a very specific uh, example that Katrina is uh, bringing it up. But yeah, I do agree with Sahan. Like, it does remind me of things that were already happening, and and uh, one of one of the things that I've been uncomfortable with in with regard to like the the conversations that have been happening previously, right, has always been like, oh, how can this critic uh, say something when they've never done their own work, like, oh, or they should try and do it themselves, right? Uh, and often this is a reviewer who who maybe is not an artist lah. But even then, I feel like it's a very weird kind of tech to take to take because um, anyone can critique a work. Like like you know, I'm always telling like like anyone in the audience technically has has a right to uh, op opinion about the work and sharing their opinion. Especially now when anyone can can publish a review on Instagram or Facebook. Um, uh, of course, of course, there are differences in quality or or whatever. But um, yeah, I feel like what Katrina is uh, kind of positing is almost like that bubble that I was talking about, that that dystopian bubble, no? Like, everything is great, like, yay, we created a work, which, which yes, like, on some level, you want to make people feel happy that we are creating work even during the pandemic. But then the happiness is also not realistic, right? I mean, we are creating a, it's, a, it's like the good place, right? Like, it's not going to 
how long can that sustain that bubble? Yeah, that's my take. But yeah, does anyone want to respond to that? Yeah, at the risk of sounding repetitive, I think it's it's what I've been saying before about the contextualization and you know trying to to really recognize that okay, I I mean I think that you know in terms of um you know do we do we just shout hooray at everything or do we be, be critical do we uh, like you know note the things that didn't work well um I think we need to note the things that didn't work well but but also say why you you why you why you had that impression. You know, and it may well be just my impression and, you know, because of whatever, whatever reasons that, that I, you know, to do with my environment at the time, I didn't think it was, it worked well. So if you are able to justify that in your, in a, in a review, I think that, that, you know, is you've done your, as a reviewer, you've done your, your, your kind of, your part now. Yeah. And, you know, what, however, um, the community or the artist uh, takes it, then you, you, you don't have control over that. But I mean, definitely agree with Navina that, you know, it's the same with like food, right? I mean, does it mean that you, every, that you must be a chef in order to give your opinion about food? No, right? Everyone has an opinion about food. So, yeah. It's a bit like like accountability culture, right? Like, like be accountable for what you put out also, you know? Um, um, yeah. Oh, someone uh, reminded us about Kopal Kun saying, choose a valuable failure, not a mediocre success. Um, yeah. Uh, does anyone want to respond to that? I mean, not not Kupal Kun saying, but like, uh, yeah, something. I lost my train of thought. So, uh, that's go okay. on while while you're. Mm. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Okay. Actually, I also lost my train of thought, but now I remember. Thanks, Ling, for reminding me. But I think, um, like. To me, like shutting down the critic's voice is almost like a, a silencing also, which which I would never want to encourage in Singapore at least, like within the arts, if not larger, you know, like, like larger circles. Um like I feel like in terms of within the arts at least, like if you say that one person's voice is not uh like should be shut down, right? Then that's like dangerous because then when does it end? Like who else do you want to silence? I suppose it's this um yeah and I know that um with with Katrina and like with kind of like the Manila context and Duterte and all that silencing is is not just a, a silencing within the arts but it kind of like echoes or has a ripple effect throughout kind of uh, their country I suppose. Um there's a question mm -hmm. from Bernice um, could you speak a little bit more about using third person and the, your relationship to an active, uh, sorry, objective voice in critical writing? This question comes from my own reflections, taught me to use passive voice and third person, and then I took a massive shift when I pushed to use I and active voice in dance writing classes. Uh, Jocelyn, you are you seem to be smiling. <laughs> Do you know about this dance? Wow, no. Oh. Okay. No, no. I mean, I was I was smiling because I'm like I never use third person in my in my reviews. I I can't remember a time ever using third person. Uh, after after probably the, yeah after after like A levels because um I mean with my with my background in in theater studies um almost every essay is in first person because you it doesn't make sense to talk about to talk about things using this. Re reviewer and you know are using we I know some scientific papers use we uh, but you know it's it makes no sense it helps you so much to be able to engage with the the thing you're talking about when you come from an eye perspective and I think that's why in the humanities um yeah I don't want to go into to, to citations and stuff but that's why it you know MLA uses uh, which is a citation format it uses authors names because it's like you are having a conversation with the author uh, uh, with, with the other um, academic, other people in the room. Mm. It's, it's really like a conversation. And that's what I feel um, any writing kind of is, right? So, uh, I mean, and even more so when uh, in, in the context of, of arts writing, when what we really want to have is a conversation with the, with the artists, with the, the, the audiences and, and so on. Yeah, so when, when I teach, uh, when I teach in, in uh, uh, my, my students at a kind of, I mean, 18 year old and above level, I, I, I also push everybody to use I. Yeah. 
the younger people are a bit more used to it probably because of like okay maybe not blogs but you know like in all the personal social media stuff that i comes first lah almost uh so han did you want to add to that yeah i i also playing that was ever kid one there also there's a space for the third person critic to exist or so uh because there also is a, the basically we trace the lineage of where this auto criticism comes from it's basically from the liberal or neo liberal academy and this like you know it's like foregrounding of the first person and and that's a that's a tendency that should be celebrated in its own way but at the same time we should also be critical <laughs> to use the frame of this panel yeah and and perhaps there's also this this space for uh, a third person form of criticism that should be you know it, it should it should not be one or the other but it should work in tandem uh, in a way so that as a possibility of moving oneself from the object of study occasionally uh, before reflexive kind of analysis Uh, yeah, so that's just my point. That's an interesting provocation. Maybe I should try it on Art Secreta. <gasps> um, yeah, but but I suppose like maybe maybe it could be interesting to review as a like reviewing as a group or reviewing as a community. Maybe I don't know. It could be interesting. Um, I mean, definitely when 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 I was first starting out at the Straits Times, and I was saying like this reviewer and all, I felt like I had to put on. A, a like a mantle of authority that I didn't have. I mean, I was very young when I started, but but this reviewer gave me this cloak of like as if I had the authority, you know. But and then when I had to shift to I, it was a bit weird. Um, because I was I felt like I was very exposed. Um, and and people would people would know that I didn't know anything or, you know, that that kind of uh, that that kind of insecurity would would come out. Um, but I think that's an interesting uh, provocation from Zahan, which I never thought about before. Mm, yeah, has anyone used yeah. like the reviewer or one? One also can. Yeah, I I mean I I I wrote in the Straits Times for a long time, and I think, I think when I started, I was very like wary about it, just because suddenly I had so much authority. But I obviously was very young when I started, um, and and I wanted to use I just because, like it. I was like way more, I was way less significant than like whatever this big machinery is. Um, but I think the one of the experiences that I started um, using I um, happened because the performance was a very participative um, performance. So there was no way I could write about it um, from an objective point of view because I was standing there among the performers. I was like getting involved and dancing and everything. Um, and that was one um, kind of turning point that happened for me. Um, so I kind of struggled between the two for a long time just because of the platform um, that I was writing for. Mm. Yeah, um, uh, I keep forgetting my train of thought because there's so many like ways to to talk about talk about this. Um, but maybe I'll go to like one of my questions. If uh, if anyone in the audience wants to add their questions, please do. Um, is maybe like for the ones who have not talked about it that much, like do you think there's a new um, etiquette that critics have to follow now? Like, do you find yourself like, oh, if I listen to this, okay, maybe radio, there's a few more like audio plays that are coming out. Not everything is on Zoom, right? Do you feel like you need to, for example, like cannot pause, you know, I must listen to it all in one go or I must listen like in the dark and like be 100% focused, you know, have, have you had to like, deal with these things within yourselves? I think yes, I always try to listen it in one go, like, you know, like, like enter a headspace. But then at the same time, I will take note of when I really just want to throw in my phone or like my laptop, you know, like, I like little notes like that. Like, and also then after that, after the whole thing, then I will, okay, why do I feel so like distracted or like anything like that. But then also I think, yeah, there was something like something that I watched and I just couldn't, like I just felt myself getting like angry for no reason. I think that also got to do with like fatigue in general. So I think also like keeping in mind what kind of frame, in, frame of mind I'm in. Uh, it's not like a past where you can just watch one show per evening. I think now you can watch like three shows per evening if you want to. And also like being, aware of how what your limit is 
I think that's something that didn't struck me before. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, Zoom fatigue is real. Yeah. Um, anyone want to add uh, anything to that? My connection is a little bit unstable, but I'll make this quick. And if I drop out, just let me know. Um, I think unless explicitly stated, and this is also the artist in me speaking, it's like if the instructions were explicit in, in terms of like when they frame the performance, they say that you should listen to this from the beginning to the end without stopping and turn off all your lights, you know, then unless an explicit instruction like that is given, I don't think there's any ground rules or etiquette for like disrupting or for like taking it to the toilet or like re listening to it on, on a bus ride or stopping it and never continuing it or never picking it up again. Yeah, I think it's all fair game. And we shouldn't discount like, perhaps that's also the intention of the artist in translating it to a medium like that. It doesn't require this kind of fidelity uh, and to give it this kind of fidelity is actually misreading the gesture of the artist. I don't know. Mm, or over reading maybe sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay, so maybe it's just me la, who feels like, <laughs> as in, I always feel like I need to switch off the, my lights. And then after that, it gets too dark because I'm like, oh no, I need to, <laughs> I can't see what I'm eating even. You know what I mean? Then it doesn't make sense. Um, or, or, and it's, it also doesn't make sense if there are people around you. You can't be asking everyone in your house to like, you know, keep quiet <laughs> while you focus 100% on a show. So definitely as a critic, I feel like I'm a bit more gentler on myself and people around me as well. Just, um, yeah, different ways of, of, of doing it, I suppose. Um, uh, does anyone want to share, maybe besides surveillance, what were some uh, interesting like online shows that you've watch that um that maybe have been like very different from other ways that responses have, have that you've seen how other people have responded yes Han. go ahead <laughs> waiting for other people to answer so the thing that kept coming back to mind when it, Preparing for this panel is Simon McBurney's and Complicity's The Encounter. You know, uh, when we talk about like infrastructural kind of uh, 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 like instructions where he specifically says you have to experience it with headphones because of the binaural kind of experience. And I was also grappling with the discrepancy between encountering the encounter online and watching it live in the theater where I was so enamored by the technology and the performance and his charisma that watching it online again with a collective, which is uh, a little uh, group that we formed called Zoom Zoom Room where we watch Zoom performances online. Uh, yeah, then it really struck me like what would a post-colonial reading of this production uh, sound like? You know, and it's so disturbing in a way that it reproduces this heart of darkness narrative. And I was never able to have that critical distance when I was experiencing it in the theater. So it was only through the revisitation and the, the fact that it was made available online and also watching it collectively without being so precious about the experience that I'm able to do a rewriting of that memory. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it happened to me too, Zahan. So we had the, we had almost the exact same experience. Um, I think the distance has been even more like amplified, kind of like because of because like when when the first National Theatre Live productions were coming out, right? At first, people were so excited, and then I started becoming quite uncomfortable with the fact that we were all consuming um, productions from this so-called center of culture in, in in the world, you know. And I was like. Why must we watch? Why, why do we have to watch this just because it exists and because they are so ahead in their technology or they had so much resources, you know, like like and I and I felt very resistant to that because of because of that. And it's only because of the distance that gives you that that you know, because when I'm there, of course I'm like, oh my god, wow, you know. Um yeah, so the distance comes with more criticality, which yeah. Uh there's a question. Can the ruptures brought on by the pandemic be seen as an opportunity for criticism to leave the echo chamber if it does indeed exist? 
It's an interesting question. Firstly, does the echo chamber for criticism exist? What do you all think? Jermaine, I feel like you might you might be thinking about this even before the pandemic. I don't know. Mm, I guess the maybe maybe because of like the kind of criticism I write, like it's a very small field and it's a very small bunch of people. Um, and I and I think that I guess the the accessibility. Um, of, of work online has allowed for, uh, I guess, more, I mean, a bigger audience, but maybe also people are just being exposed to more and being able to form uh, opinions um, on a wider variety of things. So I certainly hope that there is a kind of widening of the field um, that is taking place. Um, but also, um, I am just thinking also about uh, uh, the, the performance that I mentioned earlier um, by, by Merlin, where she's, she's almost kind of inviting subjectivity, right? Like she, it, I'm going to quote from a, a piece of text that she performed um, that she, she, she's basically performing this from her bedroom um, to a camera, to small groups of 10 to 12 people on Zoom. And in one of the sections, um, she says the camera has become my audience, but it is probably the most neutral lens there is. Um, but then I realized that this neutrality is boring and it kills the tension. And then she then goes, goes on to invite whoever is watching um, to watch her with, with all assumptions, all biasness, all prejudice. And, and, I, and I think that there is a, yeah, I guess there is a kind of breaking down um, of what perhaps that, that, that cloak that you mentioned, Nabila, that, that, that is kind of like coming down. Um, but also that there is a wider spectrum of people um, with a wider spectrum of um, assumptions and biases that have access to work like this now. Mm. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you can see the, there's a question. Oh, I think only I can see it, but yeah. So there's a question that says, there's been a sense of care and sensitivity to the impact of the pandemic on artists and the process of making art in this new climate. What is the critic's responsibility to the audience slash spectator? So we haven't quite talked about this, but what is our responsibility towards our uh, towards the audience? I think honesty, honestly. Like not just a very superficial honesty, but a very deep and interrogated honesty. I think that the same way there is a sense of care and sensitivity to the impact of the pandemic on artists, I think care and sensitivity also includes like really thinking about how you receive the artwork. And I think like the responsibility to the audience or like other spectators will be how do you translate this, what you have received into something else. Yeah. I'm actually thinking about something that Katrina brought up just now, you know, like, because I think the relationship between like artists and like critics, I think it's a durational one. It's not just a one off, like, it's not just about one piece of criticism you write of one artwork. I think the more trust you build over the years or like over the multiple iterations that you continue conversations with, then maybe like there is more room for like the brutality that we all we are we keep talking about during this session. I mean, it's a it's a making friends, right? The longer your friends with someone, sometimes it's easier to hear bad stuff from them. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. If you're a beginning beginner reviewer coming out, right, the first time you write a review, if it's negative, it's very hard to come back from that. I feel I've seen some examples. Uh, yeah. <laughs> You, you do feel like you need to build up like a bank of, 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 of goodwill or people have to know where you're coming from or your intentions at least. Yeah, at the very least. Sorry, Zahan. Uh, no, just answering that question, uh, which, yeah, about the responsibility to the audience and spectator, especially on the, in, in terms of 
in times of the pandemic, when there's an onslaught of various content from all over the world, you know, there, there's this greater responsibility for, you know, the critic to, in a way, speak truth or represent a certain account of truth uh, so that we can help be not be discerning on behalf of, but be discerning for so that the audience and the spectator can make certain decisions based on our account of a production or a show. So in that sense, it falls back into the beginning where instead of having like a blunting of critical faculties, there should be a heightening because the responsibility of the critic becomes even, it, it comes into sharper focus at this point in time with so many productions being made available all across the world. Mm. Yeah. Jocelyn, your thoughts? Yeah, actually very similar to, to what Zelting and Zerhan have already said. I think especially when, uh, you know, not, not only is there an explosion of things online, but also that they, sometimes they stay online for, for longer, for a certain period of time. So there is a chance that, that people can uh, actually, or people may actually read something that you wrote and then may go and watch the thing for themselves. So I think it is about maintaining this or building this this relationship, like Selfie said. It's about being honest from your point of view. You know, this is this was my experience. Um, and it could be because X, Y, Z. Then okay, you you go and watch the thing for yourself. And you know, but but the, my responsibility is to tell you my my you know honest experience and you know kind of what I got from from it. Uh, given my my perspective, you know, I, of course someone else may come from a very different perspective, and that's that's valid too. So it's to keep this going, really, to keep this, this open conversation going. And, and we need that, we need the honesty and the criticality for that. Because otherwise it becomes, again, going back to what Katrina, Katrina said, that it's just this hooray and everyone's just hooray, right? Yeah. Uh, I, I feel like, um, I feel like even like what Zan was saying about kind of heightening, right? I feel even deeply for the role of the critic as an activist, but um, for like for the arts in general and, and for championing like the arts during this time, especially um, when I'm writing a piece of like any kind of writing. So maybe not even, not just reviews, but when I'm writing an editorial piece, um, but I feel, I definitely feel the need that I want to speak on behalf of, not maybe not on behalf, but for the artist, if I can, if I have a platform to do it. Um, I don't think it means that I'm, I don't write for the audience or the spectator, but at this point of time, I feel more responsibility towards the artist, but this is personally for me. Um, yeah, it, it may not be the same for, for the rest of you critics. And also I wanted to also highlight that like, I mean, we are five people from the critics reading group, but there are also other people who are in the reading group as well. And, and I think for the last two years or so, We've been talking about reviewing and criticism, uh, and, and we've been trying to like introduce like criticality into the critics' work. But the conversations that we've been having, like even from twenty eighteen and and now, are like so vastly different that I feel like there's no one way to define the role of the critic. Um, yeah, I don't know whether you all agree, but but I feel like um, it's it's kind of like evolving, and we are always constantly having to move like as fast as the artist or maybe faster sometimes um, if not if not just catching up because yeah I don't know I don't know whether that makes sense but but definitely like um, the idea of it being a kind of like a roving um, roving act or roving practice I guess it makes it exciting yeah so uh, we well we are at nine o'clock so um, I, I will kind of like draw this to a close Thank you so much to the speakers for sharing so honestly about how you're feeling, about some of the grappling that we've had to do during this time. And even maybe before the pandemic, you know, some of these thoughts of yours may, may have been things that you've been thinking about, you know, for the past few years. Um, um, and definitely we have critics like, you know, like Corrie Tan and all who've always been talking about like vulnerability and embeddedness of the critic and all. So it's not like just a pandemic kind of thing as well. Uh, um, it's something that's part of like the conversations that we've been having. 
Um, yeah, so thank you to the panelists. Uh, we have come to the end of the panel. So if you want to, you can switch off your videos. Um, for the rest of the audience members, I mean, just some closing remarks. Uh, this does mark the end of Burning Questions, the series. Uh, we do thank you so much if you've joined us for the other panels as well. Uh, it's a totally new thing that we at Art Secretor have been trying out. Um, and and uh, if you want to join any of our reviewing courses, um, you might be interested, please uh, do apply for, um, for the workshops or the courses that we're doing that's on the slide right now. Uh, the other thing is that for this particular panel today, uh, we are collecting some feedback and we, uh, we request that if you can, please uh, scan that QR code or there's a link in our chat, which uh, we are collecting uh, some of your responses about today's panel in particular. So it's only for today's panel. Um, and we hope we can do that. Um, if you can, we'd love if you can visit our website as well, artsecreator.com. We always have new uh, new kind of content every week. If you're new to us, please do uh, check us out. Um, we are also on Spotify. We have a reviewing podcast. If anyone wants to check us out, uh, we can just search Artsy Creator. But otherwise, uh, thank you so much for tonight. Thank you so much for joining us. And yeah, we hope you have a pleasant rest of the day wherever you're watching us from. Yeah. Thank you very much and good night.